this is my first time here, and I'm at family camp. My wife is not here. Um, her dad's 91 and in assisted living four hours from us. We live in Atlanta. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he's got some doctor's appointments. And she's like, I got to got to I got to take care of him and so I'm here by myself for family week so please adopt me at least short term foster me if you don't like my messages you can foster me for like a meal every now and then and uh, I I haven't met anybody is anybody here from the northeast I have not met anyone that I've had a personal conversation with okay right here just now um but like Colorado and Clearwater, Florida, and, and it's like, I, I thought I'd get to talk to people from the Northeast, and I, I'm glad some of you are, are here. Um, one person greeted me, and um, before the meal, before we even went in the dining hall, and said, well, you just got here, right? And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. They, they've been expecting me. They've been praying for me. Um, you know, Charles Zimmerman's gone, and I'm the new guy, and I, I feel welcomed. And I said, how'd you know that? He goes, because you still have your name tag on. <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay. So I, I've officially removed it now. So I, now, I'm, now I'm cool like some of you three-generation families just do. When you drive into the parking lot, you take your name tags off. I um, want to introduce you to my family. Here we are. Um, all you have to do is know the numbers one, two, and three. Say one, two, three. Okay, one wife. Okay, um, that's her in the picture to, to your right, my left. Her name is Ellen. Um, this December 20th will be 41 years that she has um, put up with me. And um, she just, she does not age. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's, it's humbling to hang out with her. Um, at, to Ellen's left is our daughter, Emily. And uh, Emily lives in Atlanta. She has her own business. How many of you know what Etsy is? Oh, even a few really cool guys are raising their hands, too. It, it's like an online craft community. There's, I don't know how many shops there are. One of them is hers. It's called, it's just considertheworld.com. And um, she does customized globes, like world globes, right? And then she paints them. And um, some people want the continents exposed. Others of them want just the shapes there. And, um, lots of couples are using that as a guest book alternative. Instead of, we've never looked at our guest book in 41 years. Everybody will sign the globe and then they display it in their house and they do it for retirements and graduations. And she does some video production for um, our ministry and several other ministries from time to time. And she <laughs> needs some new camera equipment. And I'm like, Emily, you're like, at the time in her late 20s. And I said, sounds like a personal problem to me. And um, she, so she starts this Etsy shop and for whatever reason, it has just taken off. She sold like 2,500 of these to like 50 countries. And um, she lives at home. Um, my wife is vice president of fulfillment. I'm vice president of procurement. And we both have identical salaries of zero. So. Emily has cracked the code on life. Um, at the far left side is our son, Philip. He just turned 30. His wife, Erica, is there. And um, he is a Chick-fil-A operator in Elgin, Illinois, and um, is my retirement plan, quite frankly. I look forward to him supporting me in the manner to which I'd like to become accustomed someday. Um, met Erica. Both our kids went to Wheaton College. That's also where Ellen and I met many years ago. And um, Erica's family is from the town of Wheaton as well. She's one of six siblings. and um, She and her whole family run track and cross country. Um, we needed some skinny blonde jeans in our family, and so she's been a nice addition to that. Um, that, that picture is a little old. So one wife, two kids, Emily and Philip. Uh, and then three grandkids. This is Ava May. Ava May will be um, three in March, and um, she narrates all of life. It is the most fascinating thing, and watch out because I've got way too many videos on my phone than you have time for this week. Um, this is Jack. 
Jack Walker Tuttle. Um, and uh, Jack will be two in October. And then supposed to be next Tuesday, um, Erica is scheduled to be induced with baby number three. So one, two, three. And uh, this one, we're told, is, a, is a another little granddaughter for us. So there you go. That's, that's us. What are we going to talk about this week? And I say this week because I'm, I'm wired in like I'm here for a whole week. Um, but it's not. It's a half a week. And so we're going to be doing a lot of teaching on this topic. Part of my responsibility with Walk Through the Bible, um, John gave a great introduction. How many of you have ever been to a Walk Through the Bible live event? Look around. That's really good. Um, those are our flagship courses, Walk Through the Old Testament, Walk Through the New Testament. Um, but we have ministry, I think last year we had ministry in a little over 130 countries around the world. We've got 11 regional offices that serve as hubs in, in pretty much every, every major place in the world we can get to from one of those hubs. And um, part of my responsibility each year is to create a new course that then we give to our global leaders they take about two months, they translate it, and within six months of us launching it, it's usually in about 25 languages, and then they spend the next year training pastors and teachers and other leaders to teach it, and um, we serve somewhere between two and three million people a year in face-to-face -face teaching. During COVID, we had to pivot, obviously, like your church did as well, um, but yet we're still on this growth trajectory, which only God deserves the credit for that. But I've been doing over the last um, seven or eight years different Bible characters. When I was in grade school, the, um, my parent-teacher conference went off the rails because the librarian crashed the parent-teacher conference. And I'm like, what does this mean? I'm a sixth grader. I didn't steal anything. Why is the librarian here? And she puts the records of, of all the books I checked out in front of my parents and goes, you see the problem, I'm sure. And my dad goes, not really. He reads a lot of books. So I'm surprised that would trouble a librarian. And, uh, and she goes, look at all of them. 921, 921, 921, 921. He goes, okay, he likes the same kind of books. And she goes, he's obsessed with biographies. And I still am. I love people's stories. I would, I would, as much as I love to teach, I would love to just interview your story out of you. I find that intriguing. There are no boring people if you ask them enough questions. There aren't. And, uh, and so we've, we've packaged a number of these, and we've got them here. We do them as DVD small group curriculum. You can also stream them. But then around the world, they, they use the DVDs. Sometimes they put them on television. You should hear me in Russian. I'm like, my voice switches octaves. I'm like, Baruska, 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 Baruska. My, my kids are like, Dad, we would have never disobeyed if that were your real <laughs> voice, you know. Um, I love the men and women of Scripture. I think it's so easy to look at their lives and take it off the page and into our lives. And usually you come to a place like Harvey Cedars this is like this is a pretty scary place to teach can I just tell you that because you're like highly biblically literate John's a great servant leader the history of this place 80 years staying on mission you know how rare that is in in the Christian world especially in America so you want to bring your best stuff here I've got several of these courses that have been tested all over the world that's not what I'm doing this week and you're like, oh, good, wet cement. Oh, no, not wet cement. Like, we're still trying to figure out where to put the forms in place on this course, okay? So you are, you are grade A guinea pigs. And um, this is not ready for prime time yet, but you're here in prime time, so God doesn't really care. He's going to use his word anyway. We're going to look at a course. It's going to become a course called Rescue, Leading Yourself and Others to Freedom. There's two reasons why I wanted to study this particular character. I'll go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. His name is Moses. Perhaps you have heard of him. Um, there's two reasons why I think this is the course for our, our global network right now. The, the first is this. 
I don't know that I've ever seen in, in my lifetime, I'm, I'm 63, so not like super old, but not really young anymore either. I don't think I've ever seen in all my years more people, including believers, in some form of bondage than I see right now. There, there are churches that are just stuck. They are enslaved to different things. I mean, it, it can be an addiction. That's obvious, of course. It, it can be some destructive habit. But the bondage also comes to things like depression and anxiety. It can be fears, whether that's the fear of failure or the fear of rejection. There's no prison as tough as the prison we build for ourselves when we take the, the stones of unforgiveness and put them together with the mortar of bitterness. That's its own kind of prison and bondage. Debt. Debt. Anybody ever struggle with your credit cards getting out of control? Sure. That's its own kind of bondage. I, I never got in big trouble with debt because I was too busy being in bondage to perfectionism. My mom and dad were both perfectionists didn't understand that growing up. I mean, any personality tests, so much for opposites attracting, they're like clones of each other. And, and, you know, I mean, all those years figuring out who's most perfect. Dad gave mom a bumper sticker once that said, people who think they're perfect really irritate those of us who truly are. <laughs> and then he found her putting it on the back bumper of her Buick, and he goes, Phyllis, lighten up, that's a joke. She goes, Gail, it's so true, though. Um, I thought this was normal, which, by the way, is the town I grew up in, Normal, Illinois, if you've ever been there. Uh, our, our home was definitely not normal. It took Ellen coming into our lives, my wife, to go, you know what, this is before call or ID. The phone would ring, and Dad would go, well, that's probably Betty Hanley. And my mom would go, no, I talked to her yesterday. That's probably Shirley Davis. And, you know, they're going back and forth. It's ring four, ring five, ring six. <laughs> And Ellen would finally just lose it, and she'd go, oh, we could pick it up and solve the mystery of the ages. Hello, Tuttles. <laughs> didn't, didn't know that wasn't normal. If my wife were here, she would say, well, you got to put, and if you're talking about enslavement, you got to put control, because she grew up with a really controlling dad, and she, it's been one of the battles of her life to not be a controlling person herself. People pleasing, for some it's trauma in the past. So much bondage, so much bondage. Book of Genesis has four events and four people. The four events are creation, fall, flood, nations. If this were walked through the Bible, we'd say creation, fall, flood, nations. We have really cool hand signs. Then it's four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Pretty cool of God in English. Creation, fall, flood, nations is alphabetical, and so is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. But that's extra credit, and I'm not here to teach you that. So please immediately forget what I just told you. By the end of the book of Genesis, you talk about bondage. The people are living in Egypt. God's people have gone down there. Jacob, Jacob's family went down there. They find out Joseph, who they've sold into slavery. He's now the vice pharaoh, the number two guy in all of Egypt, and it's it's this wonderful, it takes chapters 37 through 50 uh, of the book of Genesis. But then you turn the page to Exodus. And um, if, if, if our keyboard, what's the guy's name on the keyboard? You, you are. Oh, yeah, he's good. Yeah, all of a sudden he would go to, <laughs> to, to like a minor key when you turn to Exodus because we, we see these words. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Whenever Scripture wants to make a point, sometimes it will just repeat things. That's where we get our song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Right? Because it's showing levels of holiness. So holy, beyond imagination, level of holiness. He is holy, holy, holy. Sometimes it's straight repetition. Look what happens here. You, you, get, you get synonyms listed. It's rephrased, exceedingly fruitful, multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, 
became so numerous that the land was filled with them. There's a lot of descendants of Jacob. They were about 70 when they moved down here. Now, by the end of this, after 400 years of slavery, now they number over a million for sure, arguably over two million. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt, another pharaoh. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. They worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. This is a hard, hard time for God's people. It's tough. They're oppressed. They're in bondage. What is God going to do? Well, God's going to deliver, but he's going to deliver by raising up a deliverer. He's going to rescue. He has a very special person chosen for that task. You already know this. It's Moses. God hasn't revealed that part yet. Exodus 3 says this, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come to rescue. That's where the title of the course comes from, right there. I've come to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and it doesn't even list people like the Mosquito Bites, the Electric Lights, and the Ballet Tites, but they were there too. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are impressing them. So God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses. When you picture Moses, what comes to your mind? Do you, do you picture him standing on top of Mount Sinai, holding those two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments? That's one of the first visuals that I have. Some of you may picture him facing off with Pharaoh, going one-on-one -on -one with the most powerful man in the world at the time, and he never once flinches. That's our guy. Some of you, if you're, if you're older, you think of him parting the Red Sea, and this is the picture that comes to your mind. How can you not follow Moses? He looks remarkably like Charlton Heston. I mean, he just has that, that command presence, that look of a leader. If you didn't get that, ask your parents. They'll so show them how to Google it, and they'll pull it up for you. All these things are true, but they only tell part of the story. And in the, in the next three days together, we want to look at more of his story. Now, it's covered in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So we're not dealing with a shortage of material. Some stories I'll just have to tell you because the scripture is, is so long. Others of them, I mean, we probably won't even get to everything that's on my PowerPoint and in my notes because it's just so vast. But we're going to look at six sessions together. Preparation, confrontation, liberation, revelation, rejection, and completion. They put me at a table with a couple of board members at dinner. I think, I think, I think there was a method to the madness of that. I said, so how was Charles Zimmerman? They said, oh. You know what we love the most about Charles? He can say more in 10 minutes in a morning devotional than most people can say in 40, Phil. And I'm like, really, 10 minutes? And, and I go, oh, am I being sent a message here? I wonder if it's from God or who it's from. And, uh, and they go, but like in the evenings, he would talk longer. He talked like 15, 16 minutes in the evening. So feel free. And they, I'm like, okay, I was so set up. John Oldham, I totally owe you one after that. Life of Moses can be summarized this year. He lives uh, this way. He lives to be 120 years old. Anybody here 120? Probably not. No. 
40 years, 40 years, he thinks he's somebody. We'll talk about why in a minute. 40 years are years of breaking, the next 40 years. 40 years, he finds out he's nobody. Anybody ever been through that pattern in your life? Man, I got this life thing figured out, and then there's some kind of crash. Maybe we caused it with our own foolish choices. Maybe there was just an economic reversal. Maybe it's a health crisis. It happens to a lot of us. And then praise God, 40 years finding out God can use anybody. Most of what we talk about with Moses occurs in that last 40 years. That's really good news. Some of you who are older are going, man, I wish I'd heard these talks years ago. Why? You're just getting to the cool part of life now. The most productive years, the years of, of mentoring, the years of reproducing your life in the next generation, whether your own kids or, or others that you influence best is still yet to come now if you're younger it's like well cool I think I'll just blow off my first 80 and then I'll pick it up the pace from there I would advise against that again most of us are not going to make it to 120 so you might want to compress those phases down just a little bit there's something in here for people of all ages let's talk tonight about preparation Preparation. In other words, that's two-thirds of Moses' life. Look, 40 years thinking he's somebody, 40 years he's learned that he's nobody. That's 80 years. Two-thirds of his life really is spent in preparation. Why preparation this long? How wasteful is that? The people have been in bondage 400 years. What's God delaying for? Because Moses isn't ready. Moses isn't ready. Why? Well, there's an important lesson, and in each session there will be a statement that starts with the word freedom. And if you remember nothing else from this weekend, eventually we'll have notes, there will be a great workbook, but like I told you, you're, you're guinea pigs. So, um, sorry about that. Freedom must be experienced before it can be shared. Dr. Howard Hendricks, who is my mentor and close friend, the reason I went to Dallas Seminary, a lot of you know him, know his ministry, he, he, used to, he used to always have heard him say it 50 times. You cannot impart what you do not possess. You can't pass on what you don't have. Philip and Emily once, when they were both in high school, they would be like, Dad, I know you have like money taken out of your paycheck each time. That's so cool that you're investing. How awesome would it be if like you left each of us $5 million when you died? I'm like, Sure it would. I'm like, why don't you go by the bank? At the time, it, it was Wachovia before that got taken over by Wells Fargo. I'm like, why don't you just go in and see if you can go ahead and withdraw your $5 million each? Well, they would have gotten laughed out of the lobby of Wachovia real quickly because you cannot pass on what you don't have. And God is preparing Moses. He preserved him as an infant. This Pharaoh is so paranoid about the growing number of the people that, that eventually it's not enough just to work them to death. Eventually he gets the word out to the midwives, let the girls live, but the little baby boys, kill them at birth. Moses, he, he, his, he's delivered in secret. Wives didn't follow this. They're women of compassion. And so his mom is hiding him, but, you know, it gets to be he's a little older now. He's going to be detected, and so what's his mom do? She puts him in a basket that I picture this as looking like a small-scale version of the ark. She's hoping that God will repeat that miracle, and she places him in the water. And Moses' sister watches, and who is it that makes this discovery? Well, it's Pharaoh's own daughter. And the women who are serving her get out and retrieve this baby. It's, it's her sister. And, and it's like, are you going to take this baby home? Yes, I'm taking him home to the palace. Well, do you need somebody to nurse him? I, I know a woman chosen totally at random who just happens to be his biological mother. She doesn't say that. See God's sovereignty all over his life. He supernaturally preserves his life as a baby. He places Moses as Pharaoh's grandson. Now, he, instead of being persecuted, he's growing up in the palace. He's getting the best education. 
Our, our daughter is uh, on the board of a children's home in Guatemala, and if I start talking about this once, I will. I don't talk and cry simultaneously very well, so let me just skip over this real quickly. But she's on the board of a children's home, and there's a, there's a boy down there named Juan Carlos. Everybody calls him Wonka, um, puts his two names together. And there's a family uh, that's been trying to adopt him for many years. Adoptions are closed from Guatemala. There was a lot of fraud going on. And um, he's been in limbo land for six years. He's been in this children's home since he was two. He's now eight. He cannot legally be adopted. And his mother to be, sort of, um, and my daughter are on the board together. And my daughter's the only one from the U.S. who's like thoroughly bilingual, and so she gets drawn in for all the translation stuff. And to make a long story short, the last five years, there's been no educational visas granted at all from that children's home. It's the door's just been closed. And um, now, and this is not a political statement, but with, with the change in the administration, that door is open again. And so Juan Carlos, um, his mom just basically sat in the U.S. Embassy down there and said, I'm not leaving until you sign his papers. There's no reason not to approve this. And they said, how do we know that he'll come back? She goes, I give you my word. And they go, how does that mean anything? She goes, it's the same word that I told you five hours ago. I wasn't leaving until you signed the papers. That word's pretty good. I think you can trust me. He goes, fine. Shh, shh. And finally, after two and a half years of trying, he got his paper. Last night, last night, Emily had flown down. Last night, they, they flew home. And um, <laughs> he, he had to say goodbye to every friend he's ever had. He's never been more than 30 miles away from this children's home. But there's no future. They age out there, and all that's in front of them is probably getting sucked into a gang. Instead, he woke up this morning in Ohio. Again, they can't legally adopt him, and it's only an 18-month visa for now. But there's a, there's a school. He's a couple grades behind. There's a Christian school up there who's taken him in. They've prepared his soccer coach is bilingual from Spain. Can you imagine God? How long has God been working that one behind the scenes? And um, Emily was texting Ashley, who she knows, who's, who's the, the mom in this. And, and she's like, how's Juan Carlos? Is he having second thoughts? She goes, well, I've heard him in his room, but he hasn't come out yet. I'm worried about him. When he finally came out, he had arranged all the artwork where he wanted it. He had unpacked all of his belongings and put it in the drawers. He's never had a room of his own before. And he's like, I like it here. So cool. I thought about that when I think about Moses growing up as Pharaoh's grandson. What a, what a world of opportunity that was. Well, then Moses, though, decides not to use his power for his own comfort. He intervenes when he sees a slave being mistreated. He actually ends up killing a man, and he has to flee. But God protects Moses even as a fugitive, does he not? That's part of his story. He purifies Moses as a servant. Now, this is an interesting one. He flees to Midian because it's not just Pharaoh after him. He tries to break up a fight between two Israelites, and they're like, paraphrase, who died and made you Pharaoh? I mean, are you going to rule over us? Are you going to kill one of us like you killed? And ah, uh, he knows he's in trouble, so he flees. And he ends up, and he, he humbly, some women are really being harassed um, at the well, and he chases away their, their, uh, these aggressive men, and he fills their water pots, and they go home, these daughters do, and they're like, what are you doing back so early, the dad says. Oh, this man, he's an Egyptian, he helped us. And you didn't invite him to dinner? So they invite him to dinner, and one thing leads to another, and that's, he's got a new family. He's also got a new job, tending sheep for his father-in-law. Anybody here ever worked for family members? That's hard, because some of you got like 14 generations in your row here, I understand it. So kind of just go like this. You don't need to r really raise your hand. 
When you graded, graduated from college, I was starting seminary. We were going to get married at Christmas time, my first year of seminary. And I didn't, I didn't want to be away from my wife. And so her, dad go, her mom and dad go, you can live with us in our house in, in Charlotte. Um, her, her dad's like, I'll even get you a job. This is summer of 1980. If you remember that was record heat. He got me a job working construction, building the Billy Graham Parkway. Just because it's named after Billy Graham did not mean this was a holy project. <laughs> we worked 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., five days a week, and on Saturday we only had to work eight hours. Ellen's folks did not yet have air conditioning. That was fun. I would come, lie down on their screened-in porch, and when I got up, it was like a crime scene. There was a perfect sketch of my body. I'd drink a half gallon of orange juice, and then I'd shower, I'd have dinner, and I would go to bed. And Ellen's dad, this 91-year-old guy, I was talking to him about this two weeks ago. I go, you knew exactly what you're doing. He goes, I knew if you were tired enough, you and my daughter were not going to get into any trouble. <laughs> and I'm like, mission accomplished. So I get, I get the humility that comes from this. Moses, then God pursues Moses in a, as a leader, and this is the part that we want to focus on. But look at those for a second. I, I suggest it would make a great conversation tonight, you know, at, at, at the, what do you call the snack shop here? That's a canteen, of course. Um, a great topic of conversation would be, hey, how's God preserved your life? How's God provided for you? What experience has he given if I wander by your table and all you're talking about is sports, even if it's the Olympics, as cool as they are, I'm probably going to go, so what about these questions that we talked about? Because this, this stuff is pay dirt if you'll explore it, and you've got you to gotta share that with the next generation. How God pursue you? The hounds of heaven, as one great spiritual leader from days gone by described it. How'd God humble you to teach you to depend on him? There's a conversation that eventually goes on. Moses is now ready, and God draws him with a burning bush, and here's the dialogue. I know this is probably maybe too small for you to read, but it's straight out of Scripture. God, in the blue, says, Now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. At which point we would expect a good response like, yes, sir, probably with a crisp salute. Instead, Moses texts back, who am I? Actually, he spoke Hebrew, so he actually said, who am I? But if you, if you translate it, it pretty much means the same thing. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? The fascinating thing in this conversation is how often God doesn't really answer Moses' question. Well, who am I? You would expect God to be, well, Moses, you're a pretty awesome dude. I mean, you grew up in Pharaoh's household. I've done this for you. I've done that. God doesn't mess with that. He, he just goes, wrong question. The question is not who are you, it's whose are you. God says, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that is I who have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this same mountain. <laughs> that doesn't satisfy me. That's after we've been delivered from Egypt. Whoop-de-doo, we're coming back to this mountain. I'm worried about getting out of Egypt. But, you know, this is, this is, this is God encouraging him. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Because, you know, God doesn't always wear his name tag. This is a rational fear. Remember Moses, after he's breaking up that fight between two Israelites, and like, who are you? What if they don't listen to me? Valid question. Again, God with the perfect non-answer answer. I am who I am. Imagine having that on your name tag. If somebody at your table had that name tonight, you're like, okay, 
I'm supposed to be at table 7. We're going to table 92 in the morning, right? I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God who never did not exist, God who never won't exist, he's eternal. That means simultaneously, and don't ask me to explain it because I sure can't, simultaneously he's always present. I, I, don't, I don't get it. So he describes himself, I am that I am. I am who I am. I am has sent me. The one who always was, the one who always will be, yeah, that, that, that's who. You tell him that. All right, Moses, he's, he's running out of bullets in his gun now. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Again, legit question. What is that in your hand? Um, my staff. Throw it down. What happens to the staff? Turns into a snake. That's pretty cool. Now he says, pick it up. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm convinced. That's One miracle is enough for me. Pick it up, Moses. He picks it up. Shoom. It's a staff again. I, I know senior pastors who would love, they believe their staff are already snakes, and they'd love to throw them down. But that's really not what's being taught here. <laughs> then he says, put your hand inside your cloak. And he pulls it out, and what happens to it? It's white with leprosy. God says, put it back in again. He pulls it out. He's healed. He says, now, there. You, you can do these same miracles. This would be, as, as my kids would say, this is like instant street cred. Okay? In, 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 the, in the economy of what impressed Pharaoh, boom, you go to the top. Moses, <laughs> he's running on empty. <laughs> Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. If you're doing this and this, you really have to be that good a talker. <laughs> but Moses is, he's just like scraping the bottom of the bucket for these excuses. Why didn't God just fix his mouth? This is important. This is important. There are a number of New Testament passages that talk about spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 comes to mind, Ephesians 4. The lists are not the same every place. I don't think they are ever meant to be like exhaustive lists. But th the main teaching of that is that everybody has at least one spiritual gift. Turn to the person next to you and go, you have a gift. If you're next to your spouse, this would be a good point to say hello for the first time today. It's You have a gift. Everybody gets a gift. We can debate when that comes. There's difference of opinion. I believe that happens at the moment of salvation when the, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. There's, there's other people more godly than me who come to different conclusions. I wouldn't split a church over that. But if you're a Christ follower, you have a gift. Those passages also teach that nobody gets all the gifts. Nobody. Why? Because God wants us to live somewhere in between, you need me. That's why he gave me this gift, you need me. But I don't have all the gifts, so I also need you. And that interdependence, it goes very much against American individualism. Can I tell you that? Not here to be political, but the debates that we're having related to COVID, those aren't going on that much in other nations of the world, except as we've exported them. We're, we're, we're more about the individual than any other culture that I know on the planet. You need me, but wow, do I need you, and the balance of that. And I think that's part of the reason God didn't just fix his ability to speak. Moses is like, pardon me, he's so polite, isn't he? Pardon me, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> At this point, it says... God responds with, who gave human beings their mouths? Rhetorical question. Um, that would be you, God. 
Who makes them deaf or mute? Um, also you. Who gives them sight or makes them blind? We're three for three. Is it not I, the Lord? Uh-huh. Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Now look at Moses. <laughs> he hits bottom. Moses, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else to do it. <laughs> if I weren't so much like this guy, I'd enjoy laughing at him even more. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. We'll talk all day long as long as you bring me legitimate concerns. When you just say, forget it, I'm not going to do it. Hmm. Does not please our Heavenly Father. What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. He'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Problem solved. Why didn't he just fix Moses' mouth? Because nobody gets all the gifts. And Moses needs to depend on God, and he gives him his wingman, his own brother Aaron. He's equipped with these miracles to do, but he's also got his buddy. What a beautiful picture of the Christian life. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if your mouth and, and as if as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. You need the power. You also need the partner. Sweet deal. Now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt. For all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Moses finally obeyed. Finally obey. Have you got a story that your family needs to hear while you're here at Harvey Cedars? My dad grew up um, kind of a nominal Christian. I don't even know if he had placed his trust in Jesus as Savior. My mom was pretty gung-ho Christian. They fought a lot about this. We went to church regularly, but dad would often sit in the parking lot when things like communion happened and and um, I'm in seminary, and one night, it's a Monday, he calls me, he goes, guess what I did last night? I go, played Scrabble, um, I don't know, factored some polynomials. He was an actuary, that's what he did for fun. And um, he said, no, I got baptized. Again, lots of denominations represented here. We were all baptized in our family as infants. But then later on, they're going to a different church that believes that you express your faith after you come to know Jesus, and that always bugged my dad. And he saw that as renouncing his whole family heritage. And, and it, it was a battle in my parents' marriage. And I said, why now? He goes, well, he goes, you know, I'm not getting any younger. And he goes, you know, in World War II, you know, I landed in France. We slugged through France. We got into Germany. He, he was in the 100th Division. They saw a lot of tough action. They took a lot of losses. And he said, I made some deals with God in multiple foxholes. He goes, son, it's time, it's, it's time I fulfill some of those promises. And you got something like that in your life where you wrestled with God? Finally, you put up the white flag, and you just assume your kids and your grandkids not waste 80 years in the duel. Dad used to always tell me there's two ways to learn. Experience is the best teacher, but experience is the cruelest teacher. Example, that's the efficient way to learn. Why this whole delay? I think the bottom line is just what we said earlier. Freedom must be experienced before it can be shared. Put it in another way, God always works in us before he works through us, does he not? The question tonight is this, and I mean, I just got here. We don't have much of a relationship with this. This is pretty hard-hitting stuff, some of it. But what is God asking you to do? What's he asking you to do? Is it trust him more with your finances? Is it, is it 
be less controlling and engineering of your kids and your grandkids lives is it is it forgiving somebody who hurt you so deeply whether it was last week or maybe 30 years ago what's he asking you to do what do you need to be rescued from what's the hidden sin oh, if it's alcohol that's easy if it's I always preferred subtle things like just being addicted to fast food because that's evangelically acceptable. I'm still a big guy, but I weigh 80 pounds less than I did five years ago. Some of you are going, good heavens. <laughs> How big was that man? People would try to confront me about that, encourage me. Phil, you know your body's the temple of God. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a megachurch. Hey, deal with it. You know, it's, it's like I, I, I can deflect with humor like nobody you ever met before. But God eventually said, I want to be Lord of this area of your life too. I still got a long ways to go. My doctor is so happy with me right now. My A1C numbers are where they haven't been in 20 years. My blood sugar had to get them down for the hip replacement and God is bringing new freedom and victory in an area that's been a source of defeat for so long I, I resonate with this guy Moses how does he want you to help him rescue others from their bondage you see if I could do nothing else tonight I would want to set the tone that we're really not just this series isn't ultimately just about Moses it's about you. It's about me. And God is going to take the lessons from his life, and if you'll allow him, he's going to take it off the page and into our lives. And when we leave here on Sunday, we're going to be like, Lord, it was really good to hang out with you and Moses at Harvey Cedars. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord for your patience with Moses, your patience with us, but Lord, also your persistence. How easily you could have said, just forget it, I'll get somebody else. But you don't write us off as a bad investment, you don't decide to cut your losses and move elsewhere. You finish what you start in us. And so Father, I pray that as we get to know Moses' story more and more and more, you'll give us great insight into him, but you'll take his life through your holy word and you'll turn it and we'll see ourselves in the mirror of scripture. And Lord, we won't just get smarter this week, but we'll learn to trust you more. And it is in the awesome name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Thanks. It's going to be great. We're going to we're going to have a great time together.